T today, I, what I'd like to do is focus first on DeSoto. Uh, and then on the larger question, you have your informal property back, Jennifer. Uh, and then on the larger question of what's the point of all this? What is the merit of capitalism? And we know a lot of things that capitalism isn't really great at. Uh, and we know that it has, if you let it run its own course, it is inclined toward instability and it is inclined uh, toward stupendous disruption of the planet. Uh, and yet, I for one am a uh, guarded enthusiast for capitalism. So the underlying point of it uh, must have something to do with helping people to have a fuller capacity to lead their lives. You might call it a practical freedom. And the, the subject for today and for next Monday, uh, bring that out. That is, uh, today with DeSoto, and I'm going to call on several of you to think about how you would use 5% of the GDP of a country to do as much good as possible. Um, and then on Monday, uh, the White Tiger, uh, which uh, illustrates uh, quite powerfully that increasing the average, uh, average income or wealth in a country uh, can be a wonderful thing, but seen from the very bottom cannot be so great. Uh, and the protagonist in White Tiger is a brilliant articulator, if you will, of, of that problem. Okay, so uh, the photograph in front of you is meant to call forth De Soto's idea of Braudel's bell jar. Uh, and the foreground uh, a vast favela uh, is all informal property. And because it's informal property, it is dead capital. And the background uh, is not only live capital and formal property, but extremely dense piling up of live capital. It is an expression of intense economic uh, activity and presumably for the most part of great economic success. De Soto on page, pages 160 and 161 has, first of all, he has some type, typeface there that is uh, small enough that I can't read it. And my guess is many of you will struggle to read it. But at the top of the page, he has a bridge uh, showing uh, his prescription for the path from dead capital on the left to live capital on the right. Across the top, the roadway, if you will, is the commercial strategy, the creation of businesses, uh, the taking of debt in order to create new enterprises. And then the process by which uh, De Soto and his disciples first map out the problem uh, and then engage in a political and legal strategy to create the framework for formalized property all the way to the bottom of society and then the operational strategies whereby that is implemented a neighborhood at a time, a favela at a time. Um, De Soto is uh, deadly serious about this, and it's a practical enterprise. Uh, I'm going to Peru uh, at the end of term to uh, sit in on uh, an attempt by uh, De Soto and his fellows to formalize a set of neighborhoods around a city. And I hope to write a business case that will be used in this course a year from now on that trip. Now, uh, if you 
take the totality of, of DeSoto's book, uh, the only thing worse than leaving informal property informal, from his point of view, is force fitting a formalized system invented in a university uh, onto an existing system of informal property. And I'd like to uh, talk about that with you for a few minutes and give you a case uh, from my own experience in an American setting. Well, informal property, these are boundaries in an imaginary informal property system, uh, which correspond to the ingrained habits and customs of the people who own this property, and the, their inclination will be always to defend it against uh, change imposed arbitrarily from outside. And if you ask uh, smart professors at the Yale School of Management, uh, what's the most efficient way to lay out the boundaries of property, they'll give you something like the red grid here with right angles and straight lines. And right angles and straight lines have a brilliant history in American property law. Uh, President Jefferson uh, laid out a grid like this on all but the northeast corner of the US of longitude and latitude lines defining uh, sections of 640 acres and the whole development of the American West is actually on, with the exception of the mountainous areas, for example, the Sierra Nevadas. With that exception, the whole country looks like uh, this rectilinear grid. And as you fly from coast to coast, you can see the grid laid out uh, in a perfectly symmetrical way with center pivot uh, irrigation interrupting the grid from time to time and an occasional river. Uh, the better way, according to DeSoto, is to adapt uh, formal systems to fit informal systems. So to incrementally add the perimeter uh, meets and bounds shown here and ultimately to con convert the old boundaries to new boundaries uh, the old boundaries being recognized only by people living within this little area, the new boundaries being recognized all the way up to the nation state level, and in theory all the way up to the world level if people from another country are engaged in a property transaction. For example, if the owner of this land uh, seeks to take debt from a bank in New York, and the property is in Peru, uh, the whole world system is involved in the formalization and the obligation of the Peruvian government to honor a contract with an American bank would come into play. And so even, the, even at the very lowest level, the ultimate chain of connections to the top level of government on a world scale uh, is important. Um, nearly 20 years ago, um, a fellow named Kurt Schmoke, um, Yale class of about 1970, uh, and sometime senior fellow of the Yale Corporation, uh, was mayor of Baltimore. And I, I didn't actually have him as a student here, but I was working then on um, cities that had too much housing, and uh, which I called undercrowded cities. If you read all the city planning books from that period, it's all about how do we handle all this new population that has to be housed. And of course, the real story for a city like Baltimore was a vast housing surplus. Uh, anybody come from Baltimore? What, oh, all right, let, I'll settle for Washington or Philadelphia or Wilmington. What have we got in the back there? What, what city? Uh, D.C. Washington. Okay. Can you, can, have we got a mic for him? Can you give us a uh, 
a feel for what a, a neighborhood constructed of row houses looks like, how it's organized. Uh, yeah, well, I can tell you about Baltimore because I see it on the train. It looks just like that. All the houses are boarded up. All the backyards are like trashed, and there's a lot of vacancy and just desolate wasteland. Okay, it's still a mess, right? Yeah. Which means I was not very effective. <laughs> um, and Mayor Schmoke was not very effective. The, um, the difficulty with row houses are what the economists call an inferior good. The standard Baltimore row house is nine feet wide. The widest are 16 feet wide. So it's like living in a railroad car uh, or in, if it's a tall one, two or three rail, railroad cars stacked on top of each other. And by and large, people prefer ranch houses, which are more, more, which more nearly approximate a square layout. And people also don't like uh, living around visible signs of decay like the ones just described. And when I came on the scene, uh, this is a very abstract representation, but the green dots represent the, the squares represent property units, and the green dots represent occupied units. The yellow dots represent units that are still standing but condemned, and the blank units represent areas where the house has been torn down. And there, there's, no, this, there's no precision in what I'm doing here, but it'll show you the difficulty of trying to change something for the better. Uh, in a, and it, I, I didn't even know DeSoto's work at this time, but I was acting on the same general intuitions uh, that he has that we're at the edge uh, of the bell jar. This slide's just in the wrong place, but the red line is the edge of the bell jar. But one solution to missing properties is to install waterfalls. Uh, this was done as a joke by a student at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, it didn't involve any actual water or construction. It's just a photographic joke. Um, but another approach, and it's the one that I advocated, is to triage neighborhoods and to take a neighborhood like this where uh, you have very few occupied units. Most of what's there standing is condemned uh, and lots of vacant lots. And to say, let's find a way to use the wealth of people living here to improve conditions in a more promising adjacent neighborhood. So the first thought uh, is that you uh, take down the uh, condemned houses in the unworkable area. Uh, and at the same time, you offer uh, swaps where you buy for what it's worth, which is not a lot, you buy houses in the unworkable area from people, and part of their payment is clear title to a similar space in a more promising and nearby neighborhood. So there is a, uh, we're creating a market here that has a barter element in it for land, uh, and a small cash payment and a, uh, uh, an effort to, admit, uh, to facilitate the financing of replacement housing. Uh, let's see, how's this slide different? And so after the people make those moves, this is theory, you get a much denser occupancy grid in the top and you get uh, some benefit from that. One, one benefit is that crime generally goes down. A neighborhood which is mostly vacant lots is an invitation 
to criminal activity. And the statistics on this area in Baltimore, and it had hundreds of areas like this one, the crime statistics are brutal. Uh, another fact is that the administration of public services is wildly inefficient, where only a few houses in a neighborhood uh, have trash to take away, uh, where streets need to be um, plowed and cleaned, uh, even when very few people use them, uh, and where police services are stretched extremely thin. So the idea is to densify one area at the expense of another, uh, and then to demolish, uh, to demolish and replace the condemned houses in the stronger neighborhood, and you've made some progress. Well, the, the, first thing, the first thing that, what's the first objection that comes to mind? What do you do with this? This now vacant area. What do you do with it? Anybody got a suggestion? Uh, Sasha. Make it, a park. Make it a park. That's good. Uh, and it could be a park with a huge lake in it. Lakes are much easier to administer than, you don't have to mow lakes. And uh, crime is relatively uh, scarce on, aquatic crime is, so far as I know, <laughs> rare. Uh, or in some places you make it a golf course. Uh, there's a place in Miami where they've created a zone where they've just, uh, it just grows wild. It's largely bamboo, and there's a 12-foot fence around it. And the thought is that 50 years from now, somebody will figure out what to do with it. Um, the, so that's one problem. Uh, but there's another set of problems that are even tougher. And that is that all these neighborhoods have leaders. And leaders are not really very generous about having you take their followers away, right? People who are, say, aldermen, or people who are head of a neighborhood development board, or of a neighborhood crime watch, they all come forward and they say, this is madness. These people live in perfectly good houses where they are. And the ultimate effect is to drive the transaction costs through the ceiling. The costs of getting the deals made is uh, astronomically high. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a perfect illustration of why the Coase theorem is serious, because if the transaction costs are high enough, even obviously beneficial to all sides swaps uh, just don't happen. And De Soto is dealing with environments in which transaction costs are extremely high, in which the difficulty of getting things like this done uh, are, uh, is, is just very, very great. So that it's fine for you and I to read this elegant little book, but that's very different uh, from actually accomplishing things on the street. So that this triangular relationship between imagine, imaginary leaders uh, would become a dominant obstacle to completion of the task. Back to Coase. Uh, the thesis, as you will remember, is that where there are clear-cut entitlements, a high degree of transparency and symmetrical transparency, and low transaction costs, efficient swaps are feasible. And on the surface, uh, DeSoto is all about clear entitlements. But he's perfectly aware that without uh, being able to execute economic transactions, for example, borrowing against a clear entitlement, uh, very little has been accomplished. And that if 
Uh, corruption, for example, interdicts transparency. Those transactions won't happen, or if they do, they will be the wrong transactions. So, one way to think about, about how to use DeSoto practically is to take the three conditions from uh, this simplified version of the Coase theorem and put them in a table with relatively practical uh, categories that you can, you can deal with and then look for ways in which, for example, uh, education uh, might impact uh, transparency and so on. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, what I want to do is proceed much less formally than this. The chart is, is kind of, a, it's a very rigid framework. It's not a bad framework, but it's a rigid one. Now have some of you thought about how you'd spend 5% of the GDP of a country? Wave if you have. I've got one, two, more, one, two, no one in this section, three, no one's fessing up in the front row here, over here, okay, we're going to, oh, there we are in the back, all right, so we're going to do some winging here, I'm afraid, um, that's okay. Uh, lastly, will you trade me places? Um, yep, there's some chalk. Now, what, what the exercise is to figure out if we can create large increments in useful wealth by spending money. Um, was it Tom, is it? What do we got? So I think it's education is sort of the key to everything else. And by okay, you would put education ahead of any of, of all other things. All other things. Okay, uh, help us understand why. Uh, because I think having human capital can increase your investment in everything else, but without that, you're not going to have the people that you need to uh, build roads or expand okay. property rights or all these other things that this. Okay, about. so education, a relatively well-educated populace is a necessary condition. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, are there any necessary conditions to a well-educated population? Uh, well-educated teachers. I think would be okay, so we have problem. to have uh, well-educated teachers. Do we, are there any other things we probably need? Yes? Food, running clean water, uh, electricity, all the infrastructure you, you buy that, Tom? Sister. Okay, so education was expensive to begin with and now it's looking more expensive. So we're probably gonna need more than 5% of GDP to get very far with that, but that's a good thing. Tal. The other problem with education is that unless the opportunity costs of the education for those workers are, are not extremely high, they're not, they're not gonna go to school. The kids will end up trying to make as little as much money as they can to support their families. Okay, and perfect. So not end up actually educating No, absolutely, problems. spot on. And th there's an incident in White Tiger, which is exactly about that, where the uncle comes and drags the, our protagonist away from school because his labor has been exchanged in a family deal. Yes, back. Let's just put a little lag in the conversation so the, the mics get there. There's also a cultural problem, like certain societies don't want females to go to school, so there's something deeper than just you know, opportunity costs at work there that must be dealt with in other ways. Okay, uh, I, I'm sure you're right. See, can you give a specific example? Um, well, I was watching a movie and <laughs> it was about, um, it was about like um, Indian societies in which like women are not allowed to go to school, and uh -huh. 
um, the figure in the movie, the leading hero, was actually based on a real life figure who went into the village and convinced all these different families to let their children go to school um, because it would be better for them in the long run, but like not based on opportunity costs, but basically trying to change their cultural kind of closed. Okay, culture. and wh what's behind this prohibition on educating women, do you suppose? Um, I think it's partly to do with the males. So it like, is. So <laughs> I'll bet on that, do you think? So like, I know that in certain families as well, like the female cannot be more educated than the male. In marriages. It's a precept I certainly believe in. Yeah. <laughs> so um, sometimes a family believes that if their females are too educated, then they won't be able to marry them off or something like that. Okay. That's terrific. Thank you. Yes. You also need infrastructure in place and like laws and an economy in place for like what they're going to do after they go to school. So like in Cuba, they have fantastic education, but no opportunities for anyone like after that's finished. So for education to be effective, like you also have to invest in sort of like the next step. Okay. So for education to be effective, we have to have a next step. Yeah, it, is the Cuban example one you know well? Uh, I wouldn't say I know it well. That scares me. I don't want you to ask me a, qu a question. I don't know. Well, uh, can you? I mean, I've got a couple of, I've been to Cuba a couple of times, and I have a couple of Cuba stories that could fill in the blank, but how about you trying first? Um, I tried to go to Cuba last year, but I didn't get a visa. Um, so I don't know it as well as I would. Um, they have, well, it has a lot, I mean, it has a lot to do with the, like, communist socialist model. There's just no, there just aren't any, like, jobs, aren't any, so like if you're educated as a lawyer, you just end up being like a taxi driver no matter what, so. Okay, good. There's a, uh, I have a friend whom I met in Havana who was sort of top five among the fishery scientists in Cuba, PhD in biology. And he was, he kept giving the wrong advice after the Russians pulled out in the so-called special period. Uh, the government wanted to double and double and double the uh, harvest of shrimp and there are limits on the ecosystem and he kept saying you can't do it and finally they declared him unemployable and the effect of that was that he became a taxi driver and trebled his income. It was still a very low income but it was treble what he was making as a scientist. There were, hands over here. Yes. Have we got a second mic working here anywhere? Okay. One of the downsides of education is, is brain drain. You put all your resources into educating people, but there are better opportunities in other countries for them to go work, make money, and stay there. So if you are going to put education as your main emphasis, you need to have some sort of incentive within your own country to have people remain. Okay. Tom, do you want to answer that? So I, I agree that's a problem, but I think it's maybe less of a problem than uh, it first appears because of remittances, where even in cases of brain drain where people are, get well educated and go you know, to be doctors in America rather than in India, they're still going to send some percentage of that money home in the form of remittances, which can do a lot in itself to prop up an economy. Great. Toward the back. So I won't take all the credit for this. Richard has been convincing me by degrees as this goes on. Uh, I think, that, I mean, I think you'd rather have 100% of that income in your country, and the way to get that would be uh, through, for instance, create, creating pools of capital in your country through direct foreign investment, and then the way you would get that is through investments in infrastructure and security. Okay, so now we're, we're, we have veered a long way from education when we talk about direct foreign investment. Um, would you put that as a high priority? Higher than education, because I think that that comes. But I think you need, to, and you need to be able to give people jobs and, and a livelihood before you can think about educating them. Okay, what do you think, Tom? So I, I think you're sort of endorsing the idea of 
offering your country up as a, to be colonialized, more or less, right? And saying that, well, the best thing that we can do to spur our own economic growth is to offer ourselves as an extractive nation and we'll build the roads for people to come in and take out what they need. And I don't, I don't know if that's the solution for long-term economic growth. That's how I would read that uh, interpretation. Richard. <laughs> I think in the long run, in order to build sustainable growth in your country, if you're starting off where you don't have any of this infrastructure or educational facilities in place, you have to find some sort of competitive advantage. <clears throat> and at the initial standpoint, that's going to be your labor, that's going to be your resources, anything you can offer up that's going to attract investment to build out the rest of these different um, you know, pillars of what you need in society. You can't just start off with, here's a school and we're going to educate people and they're going to keep all the value within society. They're going to capitalize on it. There's not an, an incentive base to really do that. So until you can actually move up the ladder of competitive advantage and development of your markets and education and quality of life, it's sort of putting the cart before the horse, in my opinion. OK. Now, um, what's fairly obvious in this conversation is that you've got to try to do more than one thing at once, right? If we just say education. Full, full stop, or if we say foreign direct investment, full stop, uh, we're not going to get it done. And there has to be a complex spiral of these things. And this is why the book by Clark that we read is so unpersuasive on this point, because it takes one thing at a time and then says, well, that won't do it. And it's the spiraling of several things at once. Uh, Shoshana, back. I think the problem goes back to the question at hand because with 5% of the GDP, you really can't. You gotta do, talk a little louder. I, I think the problem goes back to the question at hand because you can't really do much with 5% of your GDP. So people are more likely to create this false dichotomy of options just because they have limited resources. Okay. So, but if, if, if this were a real exercise and you had control over 5% of the GDP of Cuba or Peru or Nigeria, um, you, what would you do? You've got the 5%, what's the first thing you better figure out? I think you have to focus on getting basic resources and developing a basic structure. So you may have to forfeit your emphasis on education immediately. Okay, so but the, the, what I'm driving at is that you would want to look at what's already happening in the right way, right? You would want to, you'd want to say there are, if, if there are 12 conditions we're worried about. You'd want to survey and figure out that there were three or four where you could ride somebody else's dollar, so to speak. And then you would figure out some crucial set of others that you would have to pay your attention to. Does, that, does it sound right? I think that's fair. I think the problem lies in, and I'm, I was focusing on Central Asian countries when you gave us this mini assignment. And the problem comes when you devote everything to foreign direct investment, when do you stop? And like, when do you transition back to meeting all of those other criteria that you laid out in the beginning? Okay, so, so it sounds like, it sounds like this is a pretty complicated subject. Richard. I, I apologize, I just wanted to clarify what we were, our point was, which is by attracting foreign investment, the idea is that it's not mutually exclusive. So instead of taking a limited 5% of GDP, and allocating towards one aspect of society, if you can signal to the, the broader markets that you know, you're an attractive investment place, you've now grown that pool of capital such that it can be invested through all the different aspects of um, what you need to build society as opposed to cherry picking one over another. That's the goal of attracting multiple investors. So, so, one of, so the one thing we're at least clear about is that there is no secret sauce. Right? There's no one secret sauce that is going to get this job done. It's vastly more complex. Now, who, who did you have your hand up a moment ago? I, I did, but I think it's, it's, been, um, it's been covered. True. Uh, yeah, I think it has. Okay. Uh, who's got, who will give us a fresh start with a. I was going to say that what De Soto keeps emphasizing is the importance of political leadership. And what he forgets is that in many of these developing countries, the political leadership itself is very corrupt and it's not in its, within the leadership's best interest to move the um, society forward. So I thought that 
empowering education will give us better leaders that would follow DeSoto's ideas of transforming debt capital. Okay, to life. so you and Tom are playing the same tune, more or less. Yeah. Same tune, with slightly different rationale. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I was just about to add to that with an example, actually, of a Kosovo case that I had experienced this summer. Um, when I was in Kosovo, they had a hard time attracting leaders because most of them had, like, fled as refugees in the 99 war. Um, so the USAID program had invested instead of like this foreign direct investment project, I mean like there, there are projects in that as well, but a professional studies course that educates leaders particularly in finance and investments and these sorts of things. So it's bringing like the brain drain back, well like back into the country and investing in leaders instead of, and so then like once they have an efficient like leadership base, they can go out and like do these things themselves. Did I just hear you say that MBA education is the most important thing in the world? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, who would, are there, why am I doing that? Uh, <laughs> uh, who would start us with an entirely different starting point? Yes. And wait for the mic. I don't know how you do this with 5% of the GDP, but I think if there were a secret sauce, it would be like, efficiency and low transaction costs. This is coming from like my experience in Latin America, which like I've worked there and I've traveled there and I don't even understand how they do business there ever because it's so inefficient. Um, like down to little things, like I know in Buenos Aires they don't have enough coins, but you can only pay with coins to ride the bus but like there's a shortage of coins and so sometimes you just can't like get on the bus because you like have cash but you don't have coins. Um, so like little things like that, I don't know how you would, like where you would even begin to invest to make those things more efficient, but I think the like foreign direct investment and the competitive advantage all flow from that. Like you're not gonna be a good candidate unless you have like low transaction costs like within the country. Okay. So uh, what, uh, what I think I hear you saying is that you've got to get the Coase theorem working. Right, right, and that has something to do with corruption, or a lot to do with corruption of the government yeah. um, and like the legal system. Okay, good. <coughs> yes. A uh, couple of things I do here. So if you're getting 5% of the GDP, one thing that we should keep in mind is that we can assume that the economy will go on forever. So I will not spend 5% of the GDP in that way given year, I'll divide it over a number of years. The second is that the money that I'd be getting, I'd not leave a penny in the hands of the government. I would give it to the private sector. I'll earmark a thousand villages and ask the private sector to use that money in those thousand villages. The next year, based on their performances, the second allotment that I would get out of that 5% of their GDP would be again given to the private companies who've performed well. Now, I'll leave it up to them, how do they want to develop the villages? It can be a holistic development, it can be uh, incomplete development, it can be corrupt development, but the second year's resources would be only going on the basis of the quality of the development. Okay, so what you want to do is put as much rocket fuel as you can in the rockets that are already moving. Exactly. But make sure that the rockets, the next year the rockets move based on the performance of the rockets. Okay. And if you were a public official, would, would there be some problem about that, do you imagine? A lot of problems. <laughs> uh, right? Because, I mean, the natural tendency is to redistribute from the functioning rockets to the non-functioning rockets. Right? And the axiom we saw 20 times earlier in term about how a defining characteristic of capitalism is that failing enterprises fail, right? And that's one of the ways capitalism becomes a learning machine. So um, you are a cruel, a cruel but wise man. Yes. In many ways, this is, I guess, the sort of the opposite of the last comment, but you could also see some validity to the point of, of using that money to try to um, improve government capacity, in a sense, because as we've been discussing, the government is really a um, uh, 
strong point for creating the stability needed for investment mm -hmm. in, other, in other parts of the economy. So if there was some way to say, um, like use, use the money to um, increase the reach of the government into more rural regions of the country or um, to like create secure borders, things like that. Um, that I think that that could have a um, potentially positive effect, and it's a it's sort of a more direct, um, direct and centralized use of it. So it might be a little bit easier. Obviously, you run into problems with corruption in government, and okay. not that that's minor. But um, so, so, so that's a very plausible thought, right? Where you have a weak state, which doesn't have the ability ability to actually enforce the law. Uh, or to carry out policy in an effective way, say, in rural areas. Think of Western China or large chunks of Afghanistan or nearly all of Somalia. Uh, strengthening the state, if you've got the right incentives for the people who benefit directly from the increment of power. You've got to have the right people there with the right incentives. And if you have the wrong people with the wrong incentives, you're actually going to make things worse. Okay. Tom. I, I sort of have two different, very different ideas. One that's sort of bottom up and one that's sort of top down from two different parts of the world. Um, the, the first one that's sort of bottom up uh, would build on the work of sort of microfinance, um, especially in India and countries like that, where we've seen that if you give entrepreneurs, even at the village level, some basic capital they can, e even based on their, info, their dead capital sort of, they can turn it into live capital um, themselves, um, especially women. Um, and if you focus on that, you can maybe build up sort of a local economy that's sustainable in its own right and not just um, sort of at the uh, whim of FDI. At the same time, um, to use a part of the world that I'm a little more familiar with, um, Israel, my parents are from Israel, I've spent a good deal of time there, it used to be, it was built up on the kibbutz system, a socialist system, um, and had many of the same problems of the former communist nations almost at first, and then transitioned into a much more capitalist, uh, market-oriented economy, one that is arguably quite strong. And part of the way that was accomplished was, as much as it pains me to say, through state-sponsored enterprises, much in the way that China um, accomplished it, um, and in the sort of building up of basic utilities and infrastructure and the companies that serve the people's needs for those, and then sort of spread outwards, eventually turning that informal sort of communal property into individual property and live capital. Okay. Um, let's stop and take stock here for a minute. Uh, we've heard... Um, a dozen or 15 points of view, uh, every single one of them intelligent. Uh, and no single one of them, any major fraction of an answer. So there is some pattern of webbing together different strategies and of custom fitting uh, those strategies to the circumstance of actual countries and actual cultures and actual governmental systems and actual infrastructure systems. We've said very little so far today about infrastructure and arguably uh, trains, planes, harbors, all that uh, should be an important at least late stage and very possibly middle stage element in a strategy. Uh, next time, uh, we're, our text is the white tiger, and I would like to be able to call on you to bring forth the anecdotes from white tiger because we're going to use it as follows. The circumstances described in this brilliant novel are almost invariably circumstances that are destructive of wealth formation. And so think about the, the events which happen in the book and then in class we're going to flip them on their heads, so to speak, and talk about what might be beneficial 
uh, to the protagonist and more generally to uh, village India and uh, village Indi Indians who come in the language of the book out of the darkness into the cities. Uh, and I'll show you a short film clip of uh, a company called Selco, which is in the business of making off-grid electric lighting for Village India. Uh, and then before the end of term, you'll see a full business case about this company. It's a for-profit company, uh, and it depends on microfinance to sell uh, lighting. There are many parts of India where there just isn't any artificial light. And the, the, it's a quite, quite inspiring and interesting uh, case. So I'll see you on Monday. And if, if you haven't yet read every last page of White Tiger, uh, do it over the weekend.